The Question, Part 2, The Dialectical Arts. Chapter 4, Reading. Some books are to be tasted, others to be swallowed, and some few to be chewed and digested. That is, some books are to be read only in parts, others to be read, but not curiously, and some few to be read wholly and with diligence and attention. Sir Francis Bacon, of Studies. Reading dialectically is essential to all other academic disciplines. You cannot be a scientist or mathematician or artist or philosopher or statesman without being a reader. Because children have fewer responsibilities and more active imagination than adults, childhood provides a unique time to form the habit of engrossing yourself in a book. It used to be a rite of passage to get lost in books. Today, our children may miss this rite of passage because they have an infinite number of distractions at their disposal in the form of TV, music, movies, and social networking. These distractions prevent them from thinking about themselves and their place in the world. Adolescence should be a period of development that gives youth time, space, experience, and books to contemplate big ideas. They need to experience different kinds of literature to discuss and to compare. They can begin to compare the themes and styles of different novels and to compare what they read to their own life experiences. This is dialectic. We must protect their ability to do this. We must help students preserve the experience of good books and good conversations so that they can wrestle with big ideas. But in order to do so, we should consider three questions. Why do we want our students to read, and particularly to read fiction? What do we want them to read? How do we want them to read? Why do we want our students to read? The fact that you are reading this book about education means that you appreciate reading and acknowledge that it is an essential activity for children and adults. In an increasingly image-based culture, though, the art and practice of reading are threatened. There is a difference between illiteracy, the inability to read, and illiteracy, the unwillingness to read. Illiteracy presents a far more real and present danger to our democracy than illiteracy. So it is perhaps worthwhile to begin a chapter on reading with a defense of reading. Why is it so important for our students to read? Can they get the same information by listening to an audiobook, watching the news, or watching a movie? The first answer to the question might be that reading is mental exercise. A careful reader must learn to pay attention to the details. An ability to pay attention to details prepares one to be a mathematician or a scientist or an artist. The mental exercise of reading will prepare your student for further pursuits in any field. A second answer in defense of reading is that reading trains children to give their sustained attention to an argument. This is critical thinking. They must give the author space in which to develop his argument and they must be willing to agree with him as long as his argument is plausible. When the author's argument is complete, and not before, the child must judge the arguments in light of all his previous knowledge and experience, as well as the author's contribution. Too often, our political discourse today involves emotional reaction to sound bites. Instead, we need to cultivate patient readers who are willing to listen to an argument in its entirety and then sift through the evidence, judging what is true and rejecting what is not. This is the skill at the heart of the dialectic. Another defense of reading, especially fiction, is that it cultivates the imagination. While our current educational climate is still receptive to critical thinking, it has rejected the importance of imagination in forming the character. We need to regain an understanding of the importance of a child's imagination. As a child reads, she must participate in creating the world about which she is reading. 
This is obvious to us in a fantasy novel, such as The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. She must engage her imagination in producing a mental picture of the strange and wondrous country of Narnia, and in peopling it with bizarre and fantastic creatures. It is less obvious to us when our children read a work of historical fiction, such as The Door in the Wall, which recreates the story of a 10-year-old boy who lives through the time of the Black Death. However, the faculty of imagination is equally important here. Our readers must conjure up mental images of a particular time and place and of a particular 10-year-old boy whose life is fraught with difficulties. Ignoring the imagination is a profound shame because it is through literature that students form character. Jean Veith writes in Reading Between the Lines, Stories instill moral values by giving models for concrete ethical behavior. Students should be encouraged to read a wide variety of subjects, current events, science, history, mathematics, and fine art. At the same time, teachers and parents should recognize that it is through literature that students can explore the really big ideas that will shape their character. Through reading, they can travel to other times and places, giving them the opportunity to ask questions that go beyond what they can personally experience. Some of you may still be skeptical about the educational merits of reading fictional literature, particularly when children are in the impressionable early teen. Would it not be better to read factual books about history and science? Would it not be better for them to accumulate facts so that they can put them to good practical use? You may even be willing to concede the benefits of reading realistic fiction, reasoning that it is close to the facts. Perhaps historical fiction is acceptable because it points to the truth, but surely there is no place in a practical education for fantasy and fairy tale? Children would beg to differ. They crave fantasies and fairy tales, even as teenagers, precisely because these stories convey truth about the world and help young people to order their experience. Child psychologist Bruno Bettelheim writes this, for a story truly to hold the child's attention, it must entertain him and arouse his curiosity. But to enrich his life, it must stimulate his imagination, help him to develop his intellect and to clarify his emotions, be attuned to his anxieties and aspirations, give full recognition to his difficulties, while at the same time suggesting solutions to the problems which perturb him. In short, it must at one and the same time relate to all aspects of his personality, and this without ever belittling, but on the contrary, giving full credence to the seriousness of the child's predicaments, while simultaneously promoting confidence in himself and in his future. Take as an example the story of Little Red Riding Hood. Children take pleasure in the archetype of the damsel in distress, Little Red Riding Hood, the treacherous and crafty villain, the big bad wolf, and the dashing and heroic rescuer, the woodchopper. Students recognize that the world is a dangerous place even for the young. They also inherently understand and desire justice. The triumph of good over evil at the end is thus deeply satisfying. By the same token, they would be profoundly unsettled if this story were turned on its head, if the wolf triumphed over the innocent girl. Their analysis of and satisfaction with this simple story demonstrates that they recognize the truth of what should be in the world. They recognize that the world should be full of salvation and protection of young and innocent, as well as justice. The bad guys should be punished. Your students' early forays into literary analysis will deepen as they encounter more complex characters and stories. The wolf and the girl are flat characters, immediately recognizable as a type of representative and not as an actual person. Later, he will encounter much more complex villains, like the Nazi in Number of the Stars, or the slave traders in Amos Fortune, Free Man. Learning to identify the types and simple stories prepares him for the more complex analysis of characters 
who make good and bad choices. Flawed human heroes like Achilles in the Iliad. Literature provides a means for him to question these ideas and to see possible answers played out. A good cancer researcher tests treatments in a controlled laboratory environment before prescribing them to actual patients. He asks, what will happen to these cells if I... Dot, dot, dot. Likewise, literature allows students to test the validity and wisdom of an idea or choice by observing it enacted in a fictional environment before mimicking it in their own lives. And we'll continue with what do we want our students to read in the next video. Thanks for watching. I love you guys. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now.